Our sermon series in Acts, Acts 3. Um, not covering the whole book, obviously, but we're looking at these first eight verses in Acts 3, 1 through 8. Uh, sermon title is called, What's in Your Wallet? Acts 3, 1 through 8. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour, at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. May God add his blessing to the word this morning. Lord, uh, we thank you for your word. We thank you for, Lord, your disciples, Lord, who took the time to write these circumstances down, Lord, so that generation upon generation could be encouraged by your work of the Holy Spirit in each and every one of us. So God, we ask that those words written upon our heart, Lord, would encourage us, inspire us, and renew us. Lord, as we continue to walk in your ways, we pray. Amen. Everybody knows the Capital One credit card ads, don't they? I mean, they've been going on for years and years and years, so I, I just had to do it. I'm not selling credit cards this morning, okay? But isn't it ironic, the phrase, what's in your wallet, comes from a credit card, a, a company that recognizes that when there isn't anything in your wallet, put something in your wallet that's actually going to take more out of your, out of your bank account. It's just ironic, um, the phrase here, but uh, I won't get on my soap, credit card soapbox here. But, and it's not, a, it's not a sermon on use of credit cards, but there could be. But the irony of the phrase, what's in your wallet from a credit card company. So without further ado, uh, here is a short synopsis of what's in your wallet. We think. <laughs> Rex is getting there. He's running, running two shows up there. I guess. I've lost my credit card. I had it when I bought the tickets. Oh, that'll be a Capital One card. Hey! What's in your wallet? My wallet. My credit card was in it. You do have a Capital One card, don't you? No. Don't worry. No one's going to pick it up around here. What's in your wallet? That's it. I'm coming to find you. I am tired of no. Ooh, I'm shaking in my bright yellow shirt. Is it work at Capital One? What's in your wallet? My credit card only earns double miles on airline purchases. What's in your wallet? Oh, come on! I already use Capital One Auto Navigator. Who wants French toast? What's in your wallet? There's not another human for miles. Be triple rewards on restaurants and entertainment. Or travel. Art. What's in your wallet? What's in your wallet? Howdy, partner. You're not Linda. I'm filling in for Officer Owens. What's in your wallet? Enough is enough. What's in your wallet? <laughs> it, it was... It was full of them. It was just—I mean, just a few samples of of the. Uh, oh goodness gracious! Yeah. And again, not a sermon on the pros and cons of credit cards here this morning. But here we have Peter coming to this man, and I think he was authentic in his desire to fulfill the physical need. I mean, we have the account, and he actually looked at him. He said, "You're here for the money, and." I don't have any money. I, 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 I think you're sincere in that if I had some money to give you, I would give you some money. And instead, he sees the opportunity 
for Jesus to minister to this man. And says, instead, I want to give you Jesus. And in doing so, he, in Jesus' style, he held his hand and said, let's walk into church together. What a, what a beautiful image. So I'm going to take a look at a few of the aspects of this ministry of Peter here today. Um, the first thing in the wallet is we need others. We need others. He, he didn't go into this ministry together. It says Peter and John were ministering together. And through the book of Acts, we sometimes see Peter and John, and then sometimes Luke just says, uses the word Peter. But it's pretty obvious that for most of the ministry, they are hand in hand. And the ministry that happened by the disciples wasn't these 12 guys just going out and doing their own thing. They were always in ministry together. It's, it's, this, it's this model of ministry that Jesus taught them. Think of Jesus didn't just go out there and do his thing. He brought the 12 with them and then hundreds of followers with them. But the ministry was done by a, always a group of people. And even when Jesus sent out the disciples after they trained with him for a while, he sent them out two by two, healing and casting out demons. So it's a, it's a ministry of being with others. And I'm an, I have to confess, I'm an alien movie aficionado. That original 1970 alien movie, the tagline, in space, no one can hear you scream. If you're alone in ministry, no one can hear you cry for help. God has intentionally made us for each other to go in ministry together. Again, Jesus taught two by two in Mark 6, 7. In Acts, is recorded right that they went out as disciples two by two, Acts 13, 12. Paul traveled in his ministry together with Timothy and Titus. And even in prison, he calls and says, come to me. Even in prison, he didn't want to be alone in the ministry that's going on in prison. The world today... Look at our Sunday school classes. If you're a visitor here, we always have two adults, right? For the safety factor. Well, it's not just the safety factor. It's because two heads are better than one is a better adage. And the Bible says when we fall, having the other person there can be there to pick us up, to encourage and support and enhance. When one is lacking, the other fills is everybody thinking Ecclesiastes 4.9? Two are better than one because they had a good reward for their toil. For if they fail, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. If two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Anybody in Minnesota who's gone through hypothermia training Right? You don't go skiing on a frozen lake yourself. You bring a partner along because when you go through, you got to have that other person in the sleeping bag right, to get your body temperature back up again. Yes, I've been there and done that and didn't die. And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Confirmation this morning, we went back to Moses. Talk about Moses. God, don't pick me. God, I don't talk so good. I got you covered, Moses. You're going to go with Aaron. Luke was with Paul when Paul was imprisoned. This is a ministry model that Jesus taught. We're not out there alone. The start of the early church came through team ministry not solo disciples doing their own thing. They were dependent on each other, and they relied on that. They called each other, not on the cell phone like we do today. My own ministry has been with Lisa. Uh, I accepted the Lord my, my second year in, in uh, college, and uh, it was like a two months after that, God gave me that help meet in my life and met her. We were engaged just three months later. But most of our life together and ministry together has been together. I know some couples have kind of their own thing, but 
Uh, we've done music stuff together. We've done youth thing together. When those occasions have happened, like go to seminary, things like that, it still has been with the encouragement and support of each other. It's always been that check and balance. Is, is this really what God is calling us to do? And it was always that us word. So whether going to seminary or being called to a church or, or going into ministry as a chaplain, it was always, is this what God wants us to do? And it's not just for that marriage relationship, but any relationship that we have with the world has always been done in ministry with someone else. I'm a, a strong believer in denominations. Some of my colleagues are into the, 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 the churches shouldn't belong to a denomination. Not that the denominations aren't flawed. It's a human institution. But I love the fact of accountability for me. I mean, you guys keep me accountable too, but, but there's always that accountability to the peers at the same level that the denomination and the covenant does a good job in doing. So that you know, you're always thinking, is this the right teaching? Is this what God has spoken? Is this God's word? And is this God's word to the people? Accountability. God has called us to minister together. And as Ecclesiastes says, we do ministry better together because we're going to need some help and we're going to fall down and we're going to come under attack and it's best to do this together. So do you have others in your ministry wallet? Do you have those people alongside you that walk alongside you, they encourage you, whatever that ministry might be? Maybe not walking those same paths, but at least that person beside you that encourages you and supports you in whatever aspect of ministry you're doing. We need others in our wallet. We also need others to minister to. Here they are coming into the temple like they probably did every Sunday or every day for prayers. And had they not seen this man before? We don't know. But they were somehow moved at that point to recognize this individual. Ministry doesn't happen in a vacuum because we work together, but also because Sometimes we're tempted to just stick to our own agenda, right? Our to-do list. This is what God wants me to do. Instead of, God, what would you have me do? Who else out there is in need of what you're doing in me, God? It's not this grandiose thing, I'm going to go out and, you know, make a, a lame man rise up and walk again. Or maybe God will use you for that. It's that same Holy Spirit then as now. It's trusting in God to say, God, how will you use me? Having others in mind for whatever that ministry might be. See, we need, minist we need to minister to individuals. And if we got the blinders on, we got the horse blinders on, right? then it's a whole lot easier. I just keep doing what I've always done. God did not put us on this earth to do nothing. He put us on this earth to do something. Through the power of the Holy Spirit each and every day. So we need others in our wallet. Others to do ministry with and to have that mindset of ministering to others. Second thing in our wallet, humility. Going back to our story, Peter recognizes his wallet's empty. What's the man asking for? He's asking for money. He's asking for, for alms, you know, for the next meal, asking for whatever it is. Peter goes up to him and he's brutally honest. I've got no money. I, I really don't think he's lying. Think about it. They're, these disciples have been in Jerusalem a while now. So remember Jesus' death and resurrection in Jerusalem? Hang out in Jerusalem, boys, for a while, because I'm going to be sending my Holy Spirit. Jesus is with them for 40 days, ministering in the area. 
Final resurrection to heaven, 10 days later, Holy Spirit comes upon them in Jerusalem. This isn't home. Right? They've made this pilgrimage, they're hanging out for two months in Jerusalem, in somebody's home, and they don't have a penny to their name. He was brutally honest with this guy. But I think authentic in his desire to provide for the physical needs. I don't think I told you Taco Bell story, did I? 9 p.m. in Rochester. It was a late night skating practice for my second daughter, Sarah. 9 p.m., you know, skating for two hours or whatever. Got the munchies. Taco Bell run. Go to Taco Bell run. Get to the little speaker thing, right? And order whatever you ordered. And then she says, would you like to give a dollar to solve world hunger? Click. We pull up and we both had the same thought at the same. We looked at each other and just busted again. A dollar to solve world hunger. Yes, I will give a dollar to solve world hunger. And we pull up and we're still laughing out loud, right? She just misphrased it. Yeah. Will you give a dollar to solve world hunger? Yes, we will. We pull up, we're still laughing. And Sarah blurts out, and can we give a dollar to solve world peace? And of course, she was just clueless. <laughs> that poor gal in the window there. And we couldn't explain what was going on, but, ah, oh, would you give a dollar to solve world hunger? Of course we would. But Peter had given a dollar to help this man out? Of course he would have. But he was brutally honest and said, I can't solve world hunger. Friend, I don't have a penny to my name. I can't even provide you with a meal for this afternoon. We can provide a meal for you. Please stay. Right? And, and that's the state that we're in. We're in this thing called this fallen world, aren't we? We're in this thing called fallen world. We can't provide for everybody. I know there's a food, food distribution thing and all that kind of stuff. We can get the thing, but, but we don't. Because of sin. Because of sin, we physically can't do it. We physically, emotionally can't do it. God calls it sin. We turn from God, we turn to our own ways, and we live in the consequences of illness and death. We prayed for a few of those this morning. We've got monarchies and democracy. We've got armies, we've got pollution, and we've got slums. We've got irreverent philanthropists, and we have crude narcissists. We're self-aggrandizing how important I am, and we're self-realizing self, self -realizing, I can do it on my own. Not only are we limited in resources, but we're limited in our ability, in our sinfulness. And even when we have the resources, we fail to respond as we can and we should. I don't think that was Peter's case. See, all these traits fail to recognize our need for God. Uh, that's the world we're in. We need Jesus. We need God. It's without him that we are within this, in this state. It's only with God that we can rise above it. It was the power of Jesus in his words that made this lame man walk, not in the disciples' ability. And Peter recognizes the limitation, I can't feed you, I can't give you a quarter. He was honest and he was humble. Second thing in our wallet, honesty and humility. We can't do it. We don't have the tools. But he did have the next thing in his wallet. He had this thing called compassion. Sometimes humility just stops us in our tracks. I can't do it, so why even bother trying? I can't do it, why even bother trying? But that didn't stop him. Jesus' humility, he talked about the, the, the humble, suffering servant, didn't stop him from dying for our sins on the cross. Being humble doesn't mean we stop there. It means we go further, doesn't it? With compassion in our wallet, humility leads to further service. I can't do that for you, but what can I do? It leads to looking beyond the limitations. We aren't limited by the resources because God can do all things through God who strengthens me. 
God makes the impossible possible. It was the name of Jesus that made this man be able to walk again. The old proverb, not in the Bible, is that you give someone a fish, they eat for a day. Teach them to fish and you feed them for their life. It's a helpful proverb, right? It keeps us out of the mindset of just give somebody a quarter. Encourages us to take that extra step of compassion to recognize the bigger picture in individuals and communities' life. You know, to alleviate the greater need. Look beyond just what the person is asking for. However, it's, it's not biblical. I don't like preaching the stuff that's not in the Bible. What's not biblical about it is it's stuck in the world. You know, the answer is teach him to fish. And that ends at the end of the person's life. It doesn't take into account that we are spiritual beings. It just takes into account providing for the physical and not caring about the soul. It cares nothing for the person's spirit. It prolongs life in this world, yet does nothing about that relationship forever and ever and ever. To the Samaritan woman at the well, Jesus said, I can give you living water. For Peter says, I can give you Jesus. I care not only for your physical condition, I'm sorry I can't give you lunch today. But in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Recognizing the needs, both physical and spiritual, around us. Looking upon those that are outside the church, looking upon the needs of our world. What do I have? I can give you a quarter, and I can give you Jesus as well. Having the compassion for the person's soul, not just their current physical state. The fourth thing, of course, they had in their wallet, the power of Jesus. Uh, The answer to every confirmation question, right, you guys? Yep, Jesus. They give heed to the cries of others, provide for the physical and the spiritual out of our compassion for others. But God's desire is for our hearts. He says, it's not the sacrifice I desire. I desire your heart. That's Old Testament stuff. The old song, give me Jesus. You can have all the rest. Give me Jesus. The world will pass away. And yes, your body one day will die. Give me Jesus so that I live with God forever and ever. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. I love the text. I want to go back to this. Immediately his feet and his ankles were made strong. It just completely wipes out any notion of somehow this man was cured by some physical ointment or whatever. A man lame from birth. I was told that in the hospital, I'm not a medical person, but worked in the hospital. They say for every day you're in the hospital bedridden, you lose seven days of strength. That's how much your, your body atrophies. Imagine these legs on this man, right? Haven't walked since birth. There had to have been no strength in them at all. Absolutely nothing. And yet the text says, miraculously, he was brought strength. It was God's work in him. By the authority of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, Jesus is the author of the power that happened that day. The power in the world around us. Now I'm not an incantation guy. Is that the right word? We we, we can't invoke the name and then expect it to happen. We just say, we can't invoke the name and expect, there isn't a secret magic power here. 
you know, in the name of Jesus, you know, by the blood of Jesus. You say the right words and it will happen. No. And the Bible even puts that to rest. The man who goes up and says, I've cast out demons in your name. And Jesus says, I never knew you. I said all the right words, God. And he looks and says, I never knew you. It's not the word. It's not the word, the, the letters, it's not the word, is it? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. You can't give away anything that you don't have. And if it's Jesus that raised him from the dead, he couldn't give him Jesus if he didn't have Jesus. We can't just go out and raise people from the dead and, and heal the sick if Jesus, if we don't already have Jesus. Because it's not a magic word. And no magic word raised that man out of a bed mat that day. It was the power of the Holy Spirit through Peter that day. We cannot give you what we don't have. We cannot give spirituality what we don't have spiritually. We can't give Jesus if we don't have Jesus. Jesus has got to be in our wallet. Fifth thing, this is kind of fun, isn't it? it? This is the kid's song. I hope the kid's song come to mind now, right? The walking and leaping were praising God. Verse 8, he stands up, miraculously healed, and he entered the temple with them. I don't know why this week, meditating on the scripture, this has just been so powerful to me. He entered the temple with them. Assumingly a perfect stranger, Maybe they'd seen him there before. Again, we don't know. But they heal this guy, and he goes in and he worships with them. We don't know his heart before the conversion. We don't know if this is a Jewish man who was hearing God's word at the temple every day and encouraged by that. We don't know if he was a Samaritan. We don't know if he was a Gentile who didn't know what those Hebrew words were. All that we know is that after his healing, his heart was changed. After his healing, his heart was changed. It said it was full of worship for his Lord and his God. Now, there are certainly places for solitary prayer and meditation and reading and scripture and fasting but here we see this beautiful dynamic of the early church. Again, we don't know if he was Jew or Gentile, but we, this early dynamic of the church was these Jews had come to faith, they're worshiping in the temple, and the Gentiles had come along, side them, and they were invited into the temple together. It took no account of the past. They didn't, uh, by the way, a uh, young man, you know, who just stood up and is walking and leaping to, what have you done in your life or what sins do you need to confess before you come into the temple? There was none of that. He was invited into the temple that day. Whatever was lacking in his knowledge of God did not matter. He was still invited into the temple that day. Whatever he believed prior to his healing, that didn't matter. Whether he was a Jew or a Samaritan or a Gentile, all of that was left at the gate. And he was with the disciples in worship that day. I just think it's a beautiful image of the body of Christ. The lame man entered the temple with them. He was now one of them, a believer in Jesus Christ. He had seen God at work in his own life, and now he was given testimony to God's work in his life. He was welcomed into worship with the disciples. He was welcomed into worship with the others. And I still hear it way too many times. I can believe without going to church. Yeah, you can. But when you believe, go to church. We can come to faith without going to church. 
He wasn't even in the church yet. And he came to faith. But when we have Jesus in our wallet, we want to go and worship our God. We want to fellowship with other believers. We want to walk hand in hand in ministry together. And that doesn't happen in the solitude of the tree stand. Pastor preaching to the pastor again. When we believe we want to be in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, Jesus' prayer for us on that night before he's betrayed was that we would all be one. And that isn't, I don't have to go where the other other Christians are going. And uh, for the younger generation, Facebook and Instagram, they are not replacements for worship together. Facebook and Instagram are not replacements for worship together. And I know people are doing the online worship thing. It still doesn't replace it. Ah. You know, I'm kind of the techie guy, you know, did computer stuff for so long. And, you know, I was, maybe I, I don't think I shared it with the congregation. I was sharing it with the, with the rights and the sound booth guy. A good friend of mine, pastor of like, you know, the new age, you know, young, younger generation church down in Hudson. And they're all the gurus, and they're like professional music group. And I said, well, how about your online worship thing? He said, well, we've done all that. We've got the cameras, we've got all that kind of stuff, we've got the sound, we've got our own sound guy just doing sound that's going out on the internet. And it's really rotten. You can't do it well. Can't even present it well. Oh, to be in the fellowship of one another. And Instagram or Facebook or nothing. You're not going to find a potluck on the internet. You can maybe watch someone else eat, but what fun is that? Eating your grilled cheese sandwich alone, right? We can go downstairs and have lunch together. Anybody up for lunch together? Uh, let's do lunch together. All are invited. The fifth thing they had in their wallet was that invitation to everyone who believed. They didn't take stock of past sin. They didn't take stock of past beliefs. They said, you believe in Jesus? Walk alongside us because we're on this journey together. And, and none of us are going to make it. We'll all get to heaven, but none of us will be perfect. We're all still learning on that journey. Come walk with us together. Know that you're welcome here. Know that you're welcome to join us for potluck today. Whether you brought food or not, the past doesn't matter. You're here now. Join us for fellowship and food. The table has been set. Not a beautiful image there? The table was set as this man rose up and walk, walked. Hearts are open. Please stay. And when we stay and we fellowship and we eat together, we'll continue our worship of our God in the company of each other, the power of the Holy Spirit, caring for one another, looking for the ministries that may come our way in the next five minutes or ten minutes or the next five years or ten years. Jesus provides the food for our souls as well as the food for our bellies. Let us ask the blessing now. Heavenly Father, we come to you giving you thanks and praise. Lord, for your continuing work in the world through the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we do nothing of our own. But Lord, out of our willingness to serve you. Lord, our willingness to be open to your Holy Spirit moving in us. Lord, recognizing the wounded along the road. Lord, recognizing those in our path, God, who need a helping hand. Lord, recognizing those in our lives that need a word of encouragement or maybe a pizza in the oven. So, Heavenly Father, we pray that you move us, Lord, to be better stewards of what you've given to us. Lord, let us be willing, Lord, to give where it is needed for the church or an individual's lives. Lord, let us help to look beyond the limitations of what, what limits us. But, Lord, instead look to you, Lord, for what is possible and what you're calling us to do. We ask that you continue to bless our worship. Bless the food, Lord, as we gather and as we fellowship together. Lord, bless as we meet, as we consider the work of the church. And Lord, your call in our lives to continue that work 
through that power of the Holy Spirit in us. We ask these blessings now in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So before we go down...